Pastor's Heart and Dominic Steele, and thanks for joining us. My guest this afternoon, David Williams, and the controversial homogenous unit principle. What does it mean and what does the Bible say? Uh, David Williams from the Church Missionary Society, principal of St Andrew's Hall in Melbourne, and thanks for coming and talking to us. Um, your pastor's heart, what's God doing in your pastor's heart at the moment? Yeah, look, I think... Um it's been a great joy to be back in Sydney and to reconnect with friends in the CMS office. And I just think that um, focusing back into relationships when we've been on Zoom, especially in Melbourne, um, that kind of actual physical meeting, discipling people, opening the Bible with them. You know, my small group that I lead from, from um, in my home church, back meeting face to face. And just that joy of um, praying with people, you know, in the room, not just on Zoom. Because you had a much more horrendous lockdown in Melbourne than we had here in Sydney. Yeah. And I mean, what what's uh, the whole COVID experience done for the raising up of missionaries and your work in this last 12 months? Yeah, I think the um, for us, the off people offering into mission, as far as I can see, hasn't really been affected. The people who've been most disrupted actually were the people who were at St Andrew's Hall before COVID started. Uh, so some of the people uh, came to St Andrew's Hall and then got really delayed um, Had a, and are still in Australia mm. like 18 months later. Yeah, yeah we've got um, a, a link and, missionary with our yeah. church and, and th they're treading water at the moment in frustration. Yeah. Yeah. And then some of the people the semester before that probably are the ones my heart has most gone out to. Um, a, couple of families who arrived on location about four weeks before COVID hit. So four weeks into a brand new country, brand new language, their country goes into lockdown and they've got essentially no language. And those no guys, yeah. those guys did it really tough, mm. really tough. Mm. Um, I mean, I think it's been tough for everyone, but, and some of my, you know, CMS colleagues in um, Chile or Bolivia or Peru, they've essentially some of them been in lockdown for nearly a year, more mm. or less. Mm. Um, so Melbourne likes to say that it had a very long lockdown, but it was nothing compared to other parts of the world. And I think for us, there was always, we were going through it, I think reasonably confident that we could come, come out. out of yeah. it, which makes it a very different experience, I think. Yeah. Um, the homogenous unit principle is something you in the mission area are thinking about all the time. and. We pastoring settled churches, I think you're saying we sometimes do it without thinking and we just get pragmatic and we don't ask what the scriptures say. Mm. So the homogenous unit principle. Yeah, um, what is it? <laughs> good question. So um, missiologists used to joke that the homogenous unit principle was great in practice, but not in theory. Mm -hmm. Today, I think the kind of mission world, the missiological world, would be sceptical about it, both in theory and practice. So what is it? Well, as Donald McGavran originally described it, the homogenous unit principle, uh, his words were, men prefer to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic or class barriers. Um, he was using men to mean people. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's how he framed it. So people prefer to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic or class barriers. And he wrote that originally in a book called Bridges of God in, I think, 1957, based on his mission experience, which was in India um, in the 20 years before that. Um, so writing in, in the context of mission in India in um, a very different world to the one that we live in. And the, there were a number of things that he was reacting to uh, in, you know, his search for a better way of doing mission. Mm. One of the things he was reacting to was an old um, mission compound model of mission where the kind of model of mission was you, um, you maybe built a church and perhaps a clinic or a school and you had some accommodation for your mission personnel. And if the context wasn't very secure, you might also put a big wall around it. And then you invited people into the mission compound. And if they chose to become Christians, they, you know, classically would then maybe get a job in the mission school or the mission hospital. Mm -hmm. And so it risked 
extracting people from the culture, which McGavran was rightly very frustrated about. Mm. He wanted to be a Jew to reach the Jews. To... And, and he also uh, he wanted to see more than just a trickle of people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus, which was a great motivation, right? The other thing that he was reacting to was he felt like the model of mission that he had been taught uh, was focused on individual people being invited to make an individual response to the Lord Jesus. And he knew that he was working in a culture which um, Alan Tippett, who was probably Australia's most famous missiologist, who worked alongside him at Fuller Seminary, Alan Tippett talked about um, cultures like India being multi-individual, mutually interdependent decision-making cultures. And I heard a story about the picture of them being mosaics, is that right? Like, a, like once the gospel got into a mosaic tile, it would flow freely, yeah. but it wouldn't cross the barrier into the next tile. So the idea was that um, if you, that people would make people's cultural understanding of how you make a decision was that you make a decision as a collective, as a mm. group, um, certainly as an extended family, but then possibly as a village or a community. Mm. So just to kind of illustrate that, um, when NBN came to my street in Melbourne, um, we each individually got a letter and we could each individually opt in or opt out mm -hmm. as to whether we wanted NBN. But if you were in a collective decision-making culture, your street would be invited. You know, do you a as a street yeah. want to have NBN, in which case we'll dig up all your pavements. But if you collectively don't, then we won't bother to put the cable down. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it was trying to address a different cultural way of making and, decisions. And different castes in India would jump into the gospel and some would and some wouldn't. Is that, is that right? So when McGavran... So, again, the homogeneous unit principle was people prefer to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic or class barriers. Mm -hmm. For McGavran, class and caste were really... that Synonymous. He was really yeah. talking about caste, but mm -hmm. to make it a, a, a principle that worked beyond India, he, he needed to change the language. And he came up with that, what we call the homogeneous unit principle, out of sociological research. So really, um, it wasn't really initially the homogeneous unit principle, it was more a homogeneous unit observation. Mm -hmm. And um, at some level, I think it's self-evident. Um, people prefer to do most things without crossing religious, linguistic or class barriers. Mm. I mean, and really we see it happen in that um we run age-appropriate Sunday school and mm. we run um, kids' church or we run an afternoon kids' club on a Friday afternoon and we, we expect five to 12-year-olds to come, mm. not 80-year-olds to yeah. come. Yeah. So the, the problem, I think, with the homogenous unit principle is that McGavran created this idea of a homogenous unit out of the three categories of race, language and class. Why wouldn't you include age? In that? Well, so you could include age, you could include gender, mm -hmm. you could include lots of things. Mm. But if we just take it at face value, um, the, my issue is that when you start digging into race, language and class through a biblical theological lens, I just don't think scripture has the same attitude to each of those things. So um, if I just kind of un mm. unpack that a little bit, um, if you look at the issue of language, so people prefer to become Christians without crossing language barriers, I think the Bible would say a resounding amen, hallelujah to that, mm. because I think there's a principle in Scripture about the translatability of the gospel. And, um, you know, we could draw that out, I could explain that in a number of different ways, but uh, in essence what I'm saying there is that... Um, the way that gospel ministry in the New Testament is set up is that um, the good news of Jesus can be translated into another language and I can be discipled in that language to maturity for all of my days. I never have to learn Arabic 
which is what I would have to do if I was to become a follower of Allah in Islam. So in Islam, you know, God's language is Arabic. The, the Quran is untranslatable. But for Christians, the gospel is translatable into other languages and into other cultures. And I think the way that Christian ministry is kind of designed is that we're designed to follow Jesus, to be discipled and to follow him in our heart languages. Mm -hmm. When you get to the other aspects of the homogeneous unit principle, um, I think it becomes much more complicated. So if you look at the issue of class, well, you know, I think it, it's not, not that clear from reading Understanding Church Growth or Bridges of God what McGavern really meant by class. But I take it that class is at least about some kind of stratification, social stratification based around wealth and privilege. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that the New Testament thinks it's okay to segregate people based on social stratifications of wealth and privilege. I mean, James 2 tells us that if a rich person comes into your congregation and you preference him with the seat of honour and make the poor man sit on the floor at the back, the language is really strong. Mm, you've you've, committed, really strong. you've yeah. committed a sin mm. in, in James 2. So when you talk about these different groups, um, I mean, I'm th I used to run Christians in the media, and so I'm mm. trying to reach out at that point to media workers. And at one level, you might think of them as elite um, mm. in that they're the influencers the, in the society. And I was going to a church which was... Um, now that I think about it, it was a homogenous unit church pitched at engineering types mm. <laughs> and there was no real um, care or thought given to aesthetics. Um, the PA was badly mixed and I was a radio person. The music was badly mixed and I was a radio person. Not much effort was put into the music and I was a radio person and they really didn't do design very well. Uh, on the handout sheets and I'm trying to reach media, newspaper and magazine people who care all about those things. Um, am I doing the wrong thing? I don't think you're doing... Uh, so I think that's a great ministry. Mm -hmm. um, I think finding theological and biblical support for that kind of ministry is a great thing to do. I'm just not sure that the homogeneous unit principle as such is the answer to the more careful theological and missiological f reflection about how to do church. L let me unpack that. Mm. So the homogenous unit principle, people prefer to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic or class barriers. Mm -hmm. That's true. Mm. As an as a observation. As an observation. Yeah. That, I mean, it's, it's a factual truth that mm -hmm. people prefer to become Christians without crossing barriers. Mm -hmm. Just because it's true as an observation, as a statement, doesn't mean it's necessarily right. Mm -hmm. And um, so, for example, uh, if you said, um, I want people to be able to become Christians without having to learn English, but to follow Jesus in their heart language, that would be both true and theologically right. But if you said, I've got a group of white people with racist attitudes and they, they would prefer to become Christians without having to mix with black people, mm -hmm. well, that would be abhorrent. Mm. So it would still be true that it would be kind of easier to present the gospel to them in a white racist group, but it wouldn't make it the right thing to do. And so well, my friends tell me, I'm just thinking aloud here, my friends actually tell me, I mean, I'm here, where we are in the lefty inner city where racism isn't much of a sin. Um, but my friends pastoring some of the Asian churches say they have much more problem with racist attitudes in their homogenous group than we would have in our kind of lefty inner city group, is that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think if you're in um, inner city Sydney or Melbourne, multi-ethnicity, um, you know, cross-cultural variation is mm. a value that is honoured and loved mm. in its own right. And so, you know, to, to start um, a multi-ethnic congregation might be a very attractive thing mm. to do. Um, the issue of racism is completely alive and well in our culture. We it totally is in, yeah. yeah. We delude ourselves if we think that um, as a nation we've moved past that. And, and I, I take it that we think that, you know, racism um, is abhorrent to the gospel. Mm. And so, 
um, my problem with the homogeneous unit principle is that it gathers together three things and creates a single category out of three things that the Bible treats quite differently. Um, and so I, the, the I race want to language and race language and class. Yeah. So I think that the Bible preserves language difference in Christian ministry. I think it um, knocks down or destroys class difference or class prejudice. And I think the Bible's got quite a complex and nuanced understanding of race, race and ethnicity mm -hmm. um, because race and ethnicity are often linked to language. So, I mean, if you have a Mandarin language congregation, it'll probably be mostly filled with Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So the race, race and language or ethnicity and language are often very closely related to each other. Um, but I think I, I take it that in Revelation, the picture is that um, all the different languages and races and tribes and nations all together are gathered around the throne of the Lord Jesus and are worshipping him together as a united people of God. And that those differences might still be identifiable in Revelation, but they're subsumed under worship of the Lord Jesus. And so I think um, I think. The model of ministry that we have, for example, on the day of Pentecost would fully justify us in having a church that was for ma Mandarin speakers. Mm -hmm. But if you were to start a church and say only Chinese people are allowed in here and if you're not Chinese, you're excluded on the basis of race. That's that, highly problematic. That's, yeah. I take it, Wrong. antithetical <laughs> to the gospel. Yeah. Mm. And so... The, I think the the problem with the homogeneous unit. In fact, you unit, can't exclude anybody, can you? Who no. who wants to come? No. Um, I mean, but well, what happens? Um, you do make decisions, though. Um, we choose to sing this song, not that song. Um, hmm. I mean, somebody told me, "You tell me what songs they sing at your church. I'll tell you who'll go to your church." Yeah. Um, and so, churches are targeted at. Um, particular, I mean, well, I'm just saying it's a reality of life. The churches are targeted at particular ethnic groups they're particular, or, or language groups or um, comprehension level groups mm. or aesthetic groups or age groups. I mean, we don't have an organ here and that and the music's loud and that attracts a demographic mm. and doesn't attract a different demographic. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, when you think about, so trying to find ways to reduce friction and um, make it um, less culturally challenging for people to hear the, the good news of the Lord Jesus and respond to it, how you do that is a really important mm. missiological question. Um, and I think uh, I'm not that sure that the homogeneous unit principle really helps us that much because I think within it you've got language which as we've said the gospel preserves language difference you've got other things that the gospel knocks down but then there would be another set of things that would fall into a more neutral space mm -hmm. so like your your media example mm -hmm. that's 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 a neutral area that's then I think just becomes an issue of wisdom and um, good missiological practice and contextual reflection to think mm -hmm. about, you know, how are we going to share the gospel with people who come from a media background? Um, that's a really important thing to do. My concern is that um, justifying that on the basis of a homogeneous unit principle makes us think that we've done the missiological reflection when actually the HUP didn't really speak into, say, the media issue mm -hmm. at all. I don't think it was ever designed to speak into age stratification in ministry. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, obviously a two-year-old or a five-year-old um, is not going to be able to be discipled in the way that a 45-year-old mm -hmm. is going to be discipled. And so, um, you know, there are going to be great reasons why you're going to want to be able to talk to your two-year-old or your five-year-old in a way that they can understand. But, you know, I think... Using so really there's two parallel conversations going on. There's one about the HUP and there's another about different 
yeah. ministry strategies of wisdom and missiological practice. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, if you just pick age, in, you know, age stratification in ministry, um, you know, I think we need to go back to our New Testaments and to work out, you know, as, it, 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 with as much clarity and, you know, careful biblical reflection as we can, what, what can we learn about um, how age stratification in ministry works? And mm -hmm. uh, there's not that much there, frankly, mm -hmm. but what there is there suggests that older men will teach younger men and older women will teach younger, younger women mm -hmm. that um, there's a maturity in wisdom and from years of discipleship that younger people will value and um, be discipled through. Mm -hmm. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, I think we're, we're given remarkable freedom to construct models of ministry that will look very different in very different places because different cultures are different. And we're all engaged in this project of working out what it means for us to be followers of the Lord Jesus in the culture that he's placed us in. And that'll look different in... Annandale than it would look mm. in Lakemba, let alone mm. from Sydney to Soweto. Mm. Um, so I hear, um, uh, I hear you saying that a, a language con congregation um, speaking in that language for that people group, even though it may not be the majority language of the city around, that's a valid expression. And we shouldn't see that congregation as penultimate or sub or anything like that. Is that that's right? Is Absolutely. It? So I... So I, I think that congregation, particularly if you're looking at it within the Sydney context, is going to face some challenges. Mm -hmm. But that um, New Testament ministry expects me to be able to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus in my heart language. We're all agreed on that. So if you're looking at, say, a Mandarin ministry or an Indonesian language ministry or whatever language you pick. And you're not wanting necessarily to have all the Indonesians and the Mandarins and the Anglos all in the same room with translators. You're okay with... Uh, well, yeah. I, I, I'm fine with... Um, different people yeah. in different rooms. Yeah. yeah. The challenge that you face in Sydney in that context is that uh, your adults gathered listening to your Indonesian sermon are all speaking Indonesian as their heart mm -hmm. language but their children mm. um, will be operating in Indonesian and English. English yeah. And depending on how young or old they were when they came to Australia, it'll, you know, English will probably be their heart language mm. if they're going through childcare or so school. So strategically, you've got to have some sort of all ages kids church going on. Yeah, yeah. so the... the, the all, all, all ethnics kids the, church. The problem for a single language ministry in Australia is what happens to your next generation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a problem that our uh, other language congregations are talking about extensively mm -hmm. and really trying to engage with, with what that looks like. So what about the idea of just starting with the HUP ministry and moving to a more integrated model? Because that sounds like what you're kicking around the edges of. Well, I think starting with an HUP... So this is what McGavran was actually arguing. He was saying start homogeneous and then move to something that looks more like um, a local congregation where lots of different, very different people are united under the Lord Jesus and demonstrate how the gospel has broken down the dividing wall of hostility that exists between us. That's what he imagined, but he never described how that process from homogenous to more integrated and diverse would happen. And so, I think the, the, the problem is, firstly, how do you do that? If uh, I think churches that are homogenous have found that hard to do. But then I think the other thing is, it depends whether the, the, the degree of homogeneity that gathered you, is that a neutral thing, like a media congregation, or is it something that may be perhaps reflects a deeper underlying prejudice mm -hmm. like a class-related homogeneity mm -hmm. or a race-related homogeneity. So I think if you were to say, well, we're going to start off being a church for middle-class, wealthy people earning over 120000 
but then in five years' time, we'll try and open it up to a poorer demographic. Mm -hmm. I just can't imagine that working, and I also can't imagine anyone thinking that that was theologically justifiable in the first place. Well, only if you cut 1 Corinthians 11 out of the Scriptures and James 2. <laughs> So, but, you know, McGavran's principle was setting up the possibility of that. Mm. And I know that there have been churches that have had conversations around, you know, we're going to try and reach white middle class people um, as their homogeneous unit. But is uh, it, I mean, what about, though, white middle class people thinking, oh, we, in our suburb, there's a a poor socioeconomic group. We're not touching them at the moment. Let's start a homogenous unit thing to reach out to that group. See, I think your motivation for reaching out to that group from your church, there are so many other good theological and missiological reasons why you would want to do that mm -hmm. without needing to reference the HEP. Okay, so you're not opposed to doing that in fact, you think doing that's a good thing, just don't do it the HUP way. Well, I just think that the motive, I mean, why should we care for the poor? Well, because God tells us to, it's part what of about our you godliness. Think we'll be more effective in actually reaching the poor if we do it in a culturally appropriate way. Um, so, what, you're now asking a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. What would effective ministry... See, this is my concern. Mm -hmm. I think we risk using HUP to justify an approach to, say, reaching the poor, mm -hmm. um, using HUP thinking that short-circuits us from doing the hard theological work of asking what does a biblical theology of care for the poor look like? And I think that that's a really complicated question, but in really short summary, I think poverty in the Bible is fundamentally a relational category um, because the Bible defines the poor as the widow, the orphan and the alien, all of whom are re relationally disconnected. Mm -hmm. That fits exactly into modern development thinking, which would essentially see poverty as being a relational thing. And then the theology of care for the poor in scripture essentially looks like um, radically structuring your community in such a way that the poor are included um, uh, into the community and are provided for in practical ways, but it's the inclusion back into the community that is de dealing with the fundamentally relational level of poverty. So in the Old Testament, God's people were to structure their society in such a way that the the relationally disconnected poor got included back into the community mm -hmm. and then were provided for. And you see exactly the same thing happening with widows and orphans in Acts and in James. And so I think that um, there's a biblical theology of what care for the poor looks like that would say to your middle class church, caring for the poor in your community is really important but the best, the, 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 the kind of biblical theological approach to that would be to find ways of relationally including the poor into your community and then practically providing, providing for them. Mm -hmm. I also think that if you understand um, poverty as being essentially about relational brokenness, then the gospel is good news for the poor, Luke 4, because the actual proclamation of the gospel, the gospel message itself, is dealing with the fundamental problem that lies at the heart of poverty, which is a broken relationship with God and a broken relationship with other human beings. So the gospel is good news for the poor, not because the gospel um, brings middle class people to faith in the Lord Jesus and then they, as part of their godliness, go off and care for the poor. The gospel is good news for the poor because the proclamation of the gospel itself is addressing the fundamental essence at the heart of poverty. So what would you do if you were a middle-class church with an unreached poor 
segment in your community. So and you were the senior pastor and you were thinking... If I was the senior pastor and that was my scenario... Because I'm imagining there's a stack of them listening to us yeah. right now. So um, the easy thing to do is to ring up Anglicare. Mm -hmm. The hard thing to do is to disciple your church family and enable people and take a lead in enabling people to develop costly interpersonal relationships with poor people, um, invite them to your home for a meal, get involved in their lives, which are often typically quite messy and dysfunctional, mm -hmm. and um, walk alongside them and try to empower them to find solutions to their own poverty, to try to shift them into seeing that they're human beings who are made in God's image, that God has given them gifts and skills and resources, and that if someone gets alongside them and walks with them through you know, a, a deep relational investment, they can start to move themselves out of um, out of poverty and having a confidence that actually speaking the gospel into that context will make a difference. Mm. Mm. Just listening and thinking, I think we've done a reasonably good job at reaching into the divorce subculture. Um, we've done a reasonably good job in reaching into the sexual minority subculture. Um, I'm not sure we've done as good job at reaching into the lower educational level subculture in that um, uh, the dominant group around us um, are highly educated mm. and the, the, the way we conduct the ministry is basically built, built on a premise of being significantly educated. Mm. And so um, I, I think, ah, oh, I mean, and that's not a particularly a money thing, but it's just a, a whole DNA of the way you think about mm. reaching that group. Yeah. Yes, and I think, you know, from my world of, um, you know, missiological reflection yeah. and thinking about translatability, what that might look like is um, uh, uh, just at a communication level, some really simple things about shortening your sentences. Um, using more simple vocabulary to engage with people who aren't so highly educated. But there's also, you know, are we willing to make the cultural shift of, um, you know, stopping going to the cricket and starting going to different kind of sports, whether that's, you know, well, well, car that, racing or I mean, but that, greyhound that, racing? That does pick up, there's an assumption there that I just want to ask you about, because um, if you, if you like, dumb it down um, uh, I mean you can keep going all the way down to three-year-olds you know and um, uh, to help make the three-year-olds feel welcome but then you lose people up the other end you know and so how do you how do you juggle that so I th I think you need to uh, you need to know your church family you need to know who's in the room and you need to communicate um, appropriately for the for the community that you're in, and I, I think that, um, you know, we we have a theology of church as being fundamentally about a gathering of people. Mm -hmm. um, now I realise that many of our churches in in city ministry are quite eclectic, mm. um, but you know that that gathering is usually going to be from a community roughly proximate to where the church mm -hmm. is meeting. Um, and that'll create a, a particular socio-economic group. It does create group. a homogenous group. Yeah, um, absolutely. People have got to be able to afford to live here, those kind of yeah. things, yeah. And so we need to minister to the people that are, God, has God, is, God is gathering through his word in the place where he's put us. Um, and every church, I guess, is going to be homogenous and heterogeneous to different degrees. Yeah. Exactly. And we, what we need to do as senior pastors is to do the hard work of thinking about what it means to translate the gospel into the culture that God has placed us in with the people on our doorstep. Um, and I th I'm just concerned that the HUP 
has been used to slightly get us off the hook of some of that really hard missiological thinking around what that might look like. Um, and I think perhaps the reason for that is that um, typically senior pastors will thrive best in contexts where most of the people in the community are most like them. Mm. Um, so in better, better for me to speak about the context I'm most familiar with. Sure. In the UK, mm -hmm. most of my friends are middle class, upper middle class people, and they're mostly thriving, doing a great job in Bible teaching ministries in upper middle class areas. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't think of that many of my friends who have found it at all easy to cross into a very different demographic group. Mm. And mm. when they do, those who have made that transition most successfully are the ones who've um, learned to think in the way that, say, CMS missionaries are learning to think about, you know, cultural transition, um, translatability, um, all of those kinds of things, to do the kind of missiological thinking about what that looks like. Mm. Um, yeah. Somebody told me a line once, um, don't preach to the people who were there, preach to the people that you wish were there. And how do you bounce off that line? Do you... Yeah, I mean, so I think it is a really good question for a senior pastor to... Um, have a look at his patch, mm -hmm. if, if you want to call it that, and go, who are we missing? Who, who's in our patch? Mm. Who isn't represented here? I think that's, that's a really important um, piece of, of reflection, and you know, that'll help us think about what our, what our blind spots are. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about that, um, and then you may perhaps compare um, who's missing with the language that's being used in your gatherings, you might immediately get a sense of, oh, well, well maybe that's why they're not here because we're using clunky language about mm. an issue that is important to them, what, mm. whatever that might be. Mm. Um, that's great. Thanks for coming in and talking to us. It's been fun. Yeah, my guest on The Pastor's Heart, Dr. David Williams. He's the principal of St. Andrew's Hall, the CMS Missionary Training, the Church Missionary Society Missionary Training Centre in Melbourne. And it's been great to have very stimulating discussion. We'll look forward to your company on The Pastor's Heart next week.